So my name is Andrew Tatarsky, and I'm incredibly honored to be able to welcome you on behalf of our five co-sponsoring organizations to this very special event. Um, we are exploring the impact of culture, trauma, and substance use on women's health and public policy. Um, I want to just say a few words, and then I'm going to turn it over to Jen to uh, introduce the panel. Um, all of these organizations have a special interest in the health of women, um, as well as the rest of us in the room. Um, they have a particular interest in understanding the unique challenges and needs of substance using women um, and developing effective ways of helping. Each of these organizations regards substance use as a health issue, not a moral or a criminal issue. Um, and this makes substance use in this country and our perspective about human rights and social justice. So this perspective, um, as I said earlier in my talk, is not just about personal struggles, but it's about personal struggles in a social and political context that has an impact uh, on women's lives. Uh, all of these organizations also, I think, therefore, believe that substance use reflects this complex mix of the personal, the social, and the political, and that all of these must be um, uh, understood or considered in figuring out how we can be helpful to people. And finally, um, because of this perspective, I think, every, all of these organizations are really grounded in their commitment to harm reduction principles, which we could summarize in a way as um, being a respect for diversity and the dignity of, of each of us, compassion, collaboration, and empowerment. So I'm really honored to be part of this wonderful community and uh, to have a chance to introduce this wonderful, incredible group of speakers. Um, those organizations um, are the Center for Optimal Living, which is a treatment and training organization, the New School's concentration uh, on mental health and substance use counseling, uh, which does a number of different training um, events uh, focused on these issues. The Division on Addictions is uh, of the New York State Psychological Association uh, is a professional organization for addiction psychologists that has also fully embraced these principles. The Harm Reduction Coalition which was really, I think of it as like my um, coming out group back in the early 90s uh, to, to, to talk openly about harm reduction uh, meant risking your career uh, and your license. Uh, at least that's the way it felt at the time. And I was lucky enough to be in private practice so I didn't have an institutional job to worry about and to have the Harm Reduction Coalition there to back me up. And so that has always been um, you know, an amazing um, friend of mine. Uh, they hold biannual conferences, which are just amazing. It's a tent that invites everyone to come in who cares about drug users and the quality of their lives. And finally, National Advocates for Pregnant Women, uh, which is uh, directed by Lynn Paltrow, who we'll hear from, um, works to secure the health and civil rights, health and welfare of all women, focusing particularly on pregnant and parenting women. And I think maybe even more particularly on drug using pregnant and parenting women. And she'll share something about her work with you. So uh, thank you all for being here and all of you for being here on this cold, messy night. And um, with that, Jen Talley. Thank you all for coming tonight. I'm really happy to be here, and I wanted to welcome you again. So I wanted to introduce each of our guest speakers. So the plan for the evening is that um, we're going to spend about 15 minutes um, on each presentation, and then we're going to open it up for discussion, for questions and answers. And really, our hope is to engage with you in a dialogue about each of these present presentations and just about this work in general, You know, the, the context under which um, we think about substance use. Thank 
that's gone to sleep. So Gabrielle Glazer is going to be starting off the presentations, and she's an award-winning journalist and author, most recently, of the New York Times bestseller, Her Best Kept Secret, Why Women Drink and How They Can Regain Control. Over the past two decades, Glazer has examined social, cultural, and national health trends for the New York Times, the New York Times Magazine, and the Oregonian in Portland, where she was a staff writer. Her work has also appeared in The Economist, The Wall Street Journal, The Los Angeles Times, Glamour, Mademoiselle, and scientificamerican.com. She is also the author of Strangers to the Tribe, Portraits of Interfaith Marriage, and The Nose, A Profile of Sex, Beauty, and Survival. She received her bachelor's and master's degrees in history at Stanford University. Emma Roberts, who will be following her, has worked for the Harm Reduction Coalition as a training consultant since 2009 and became a capacity building manager in 2014. Her focus is to provide technical assistance and support to programs promoting syringe access, drug user health, hepatitis C services, and overdose prevention. Originally from the UK, Emma started her career in community <coughs> development work in 1990 and became involved in harm reduction work in 1996. She has managed and led various community-based programs, including Getaway Girls, a young women's charity for seven years. Prior to her work with the Harm Reduction Coalition, Emma coordinated a syringe exchange program and mobile health program providing mental, medical and dental services to vulnerable, street-based, and homeless populations in New York City. And finally, Lynn Paltrow is the founder and executive director of the National Advocates for Pregnant Women. Ms. Paltrow is a graduate of Cornell University and New York University School of Law. As executive director of NAPW, Ms. Paltrow combines legal advocacy, public education, grassroots, and national organizing, research, and policy work to secure the human and civil rights, health and welfare of all women, focusing particularly on pregnant and parenting women, and those who are most vulnerable to state control and punishment, low-income women, women of color, and drug-using women. She is a frequent guest lecturer and writer for popular press, law reviews, and peer-reviewed journals. Ms. Paltrow is also a Gemini and a mother of twins. <laughs> Gabrielle. Thank you so much for coming and for having me. Thank you very much, Jen and Andrew. In 2008, I went through a very stressful cross-country move with my three children and my husband as he was starting a new job in New York. I was leaving my beloved home state of Oregon for the Northeast, and I found myself, I quit my job, and I found myself drinking more wine than usual. It wasn't just two glasses, it was three glasses. And I very quickly understood that it wasn't helping me very much because I wasn't very functional in the evening. But it also gave me a look at how, easy, how easily alcohol had become intertwined with women's lives. And I saw it in my new suburb where women dumped their empty wine bottles in the recycling bin. I saw it with moms who joked about going to PTA meetings with flasks, and they did. And it was everywhere in popular culture. It was on Scandal, it was on Real Housewives, it was on Cougar Town, as kind of a joke. And I put this into research, three years of research, it, it struck me so, so deeply that I thought, I have to examine this a little bit more carefully. And I, for three years, I did the research and came out with the book, Her Best Kept Secret, and learned several things that I'd like to share with you today. Epidemiologists say that women are drinking more than any time than ever before in American history, and there are a lot of reasons for that. The first one, surprisingly, is college. Even though more women are in universities today, activities are still completely dominated by what men do, which is go to dive bars and tailgate and fraternity parties. And so there's a lot of drinking that goes on. And the expectation is that you binge drink. There's no, we don't have a culture which teaches young people how to moderate. We say, oh no, you can't touch it until you're 21. And then of course the expectation is that you go to college and you 
drink like a fool. And you continue that drinking into your work life and into, in many cases, well into your 30s. And it's a very handy antidote. Joan Didion says this, it's the best anti-anxiety antidote there possibly is, and we know that. But it, and it really can come in handy when you've got work deadlines and children's demands and aging parents who live several states away. But the, the problem is for women that women react to alcohol differently. First of all, they are twice as likely to be diagnosed with depression and anxiety disorders. They are much more likely to have suffered from eating disorders and to have been sexually abused. All of these factors are risk factors for drinking too much. And it's important to remember that biologically, women simply cannot drink like men can. You know, we tell our daughters, you can do everything a boy can, but there's really an exception to that, and that's drinking. Women have more fat in their bodies, which retains alcohol, and more water, less water than men's. Water dilutes alcohol. So alcohol gets into the bloodstream of a woman much sooner. It affects her organs much sooner. She makes less of uh, an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase, which helps process the alcohol. And the toxic effects of booze go to women's organs much, much sooner. Even if you have a same a man who weighs the same as a woman drinking the same amount, the same, same weighted people drinking the same amount, a woman is going to get suffer from alcohol's toxic effects much more sooner. And a lot of people have been studying why women are drinking more. There's a psychologist at the University of North Dakota who has been looking at this trend around the world. It's not just in the United States. Women everywhere are drinking more. And in the early 1980s, the answer to the question, are you concerned about your drinking? One in 10 people answered, women answered that question. By 2002, one in five had answered that. And of course, people go to recovery groups, they go to, they enter rehab. The number of women, middle-aged women who are going to rehab has tripled in the past several years. The number of women who have gotten arrested for drunk driving has risen by 30%. The number of young women who find themselves in the hospital for being dangerously intoxicated has risen by about 54% in just 10 years. And the number of women who are dying from cirrhosis of the liver has skyrocketed. So what do we do about this? We early on, ta Andrew talked about the, the the, the method, the traditional abstinence-only method, which tells people you must admit that you're powerless over this substance, and you must submit to a higher power in order to get better. And a lot of women don't find that message very, I mean, forgive the, the reuse of the word, but they don't find that empowering. They find it disempowering. And it really doesn't take a genius in gender studies to, to, to notice that women and, women and men may be drinking for different reasons anyway. Women tend to drink in isolation. They tend to drink at home. Men tr tend to drink in groups, celebrating something out in bars. And there are so many different ways in which this one-size-fits-all system that we have in place in our legal system, our medical establishment, certainly in popular culture, that, that we need to change. And I thought I'd share with you some of the people I researched and who I met in the course of my, my reporting who found alternative methods that really helped them. One is a woman named Donna Dierker, who is a neuroscientist in St. Louis. And she found herself, after the birth of her first child, drinking an astonishing amount of alcohol. It was very stressful and he was a colicky baby, and she was drinking a lot. And by the time he was a year old, she was putting down two six-packs and two bottles of wine every weekend. It was her reward, she thought, for you know getting through the week with this colicky kid. And then she decided, you know what? This is really not helping me very much. I feel really crappy on Sunday morning. It takes me back to Monday to get, you know, get myself back up to speed. And she, she knew AA wasn't for her, 
she was an agnostic, she didn't like the powerless message, and she found something called moderation management. It was a group that was founded in 1993 that um, is secular, and like AA, it offers a program that starts with an alcohol-free period, but unlike it, moderation management limits that to a 30-day period doesn't ask you to turn over to a higher power to achieve sobriety. Instead, it focuses on self-monitoring so that people can live better lives, which, by the way, moderation management says includes moderate amounts of alcohol. Um, it's steps, it has nine steps, nine steps, nine steps, consist of very common sense exercises, such as write down your life priorities, Take a look at how much you drink, how often, and under what circumstances you drink. Donna tells me that MM has taught her to pay attention to how each drink tastes and how she feels after it. And for the past seven years, she's alternated her drinking with one month of abstention with two months of moderate drinking. MM defines moderate drinking as no more than three drinks at one sitting and no more than nine drinks per week for women. And she now says that drinking has become a treat to her. Another woman, Jane, lives in Virginia. She really likes to drink. She loves the buzz. When she lost her job in 2008, she found herself seeking comfort in her Pinot Noir. She went from having a glass or two each night to polishing off a bottle. And within a year, she had turned to a pint of vodka a night, just not even bothering with the wine. She felt terrible all the time. She looked bad, but she didn't know how to get out of the hole she was in. She knew as an agnostic, AA was not for her. She didn't believe she was powerless. And she saw her drinking as a choice that she used to make herself feel better temporarily. She searched online and found HAMS, Harm Reduction, Abstinence, and Moderation Support, which was founded in Brooklyn in 2007. Harm reduction recognizes recreational <laughs> intoxication as a reality and seeks to reduce the harm associated with it, but allows members to name an objective, whether it's safer drinking, moderate drinking, or abstention, and craft their own plan to get there. That's very important. It allows members to craft their own plan to get there. You can use the whole tool toolkit if you want. You can use 30 steps, you can use nine steps, you can start drinking at 7.30 and limit yourself to drinking only until 8.30. But it gives you tools to, ch to change the way you are, you are involved with your substance. Jane participated from chat rooms and abstained for the 30 days. It was a challenge, she really missed the alcohol. Um, she read books, she cooked, she played her guitar. And after she reintroduced alcohol into her life, she followed the ham's suggestions and took notes when she drank. When she reviewed the notes the next day, she saw that she felt good after the first and second drinks, but really worse after the third and fourth. Her handwriting was crappy, her cognitive functioning was bad, and she wasn't enjoying it. And she realized that alcohol had brought her pleasure temporarily. What really made her happy was playing her guitar, cooking, and reading. And when you're trying to read on four glasses of wine, chances are you're probably not going to re remember what you read the next day. And so she said the greatest revelation for her was that she remembered what she read the next day. Some women are also modifying their drinking with pharmaceutical aids. Um, now, Trexone, which was approved by the FDA in 1994 for use the US government says it's an abstinence drug, um, is an opioid antagonist. When you drink, your brain releases endorphins. And an opioid antagonist stops the endorphins from, reading, from reaching the opioid receptors. So you can drink, and you might have the pleasure of the taste and the pleasure of the social company if you're out with your friends, but you're not going to get a buzz you're not going to get the reward of the endorphins. And in the US, doctors tell you to take the drug and not drink. But in Finland, where the use of this drug was pioneered, 
in a very different way. The protocol is to give the drug an hour before drinking. And over time, you lose. It's like a learned behavior. It's like Pavlov, Pavlov's dogs. You take the drink. Remember the dogs, um, their, their, their mouths would water when the bell rang and the white coats, white coat lab assistants would come in to, to bring the food. And after a while, they stopped. When they didn't bring the food, they stopped salivating. Well, if you use naltrexone in the way that this method, it's called the Sinclair method, is prescribed, you start to lose the reward of drinking, and you become a moderate drinker. This is the go-to methodology in Finland. And it is criminal that we do not use this tool here. Now, the Finns may have a special gene variant that makes them particularly susceptible to, the, to this drug being successful. But within study after study after study in peer-reviewed journals shows that within six months of using this drug in Finland, and by the way, it's generic. Nobody's making any, nobody's making a lot of money off this. But this is, uh, it, it's off patent, and pharmaceutical companies don't have an incentive to try to push it, so nobody hears about it. But 75% of Finns who take this protocol return within six months using cognitive behavioral training, motivational interviewing, and the drug. They return to the safe limits set within the Finnish, set by the Finnish government. And those are prolonged results, by the way. The vast majority of problem drinkers in this country don't get assistance, as Andrew said earlier. In some ways, it's a positive sign that a few people here and there are finding better ways to, to get better, or new ways to get better. And people, obviously, if you have success with AA, if it's not broke, don't fix it. But if you fail, if you feel that the program fails you, as the vast majority of people do. It's so important that we're having gatherings like this and talking about the other methodologies out there. There are so many other tools. This is not a one-size-fits-all problem. Thank you. Jen, how do you want to do that? Do you want to stand up? Yeah, I'll do it. Okay. And then just push that down. Thank you. Yeah. So I needed I needed a PowerPoint to keep me on track because there's so much we could say about the topic of harm reduction. Um, so as I'm from the UK, I bought you a London bus, yeah. uh, <laughs> and this was a. Um, uh, a campaign that was taken out by Release, which is a, an advocacy group in England that campaigns for legal rights of people who use drugs, and they took this out to challenge stigma, because uh, Andrew and other, oh, sorry, can you hear me? As other, um, as Andrew in the introduction, that, that's better? Yes. You can hear me, right? All right, um, you know, pointed out stigma plays a huge um, part in, um, you know, the impacts of people's, um, you know, drug use. Um, so. And just to say, I, you know, I started out in 96 when the, I was working in a community centre in the north of England and the, they, they, they put a syringe exchange in the corner of the hall of our community centre. And back then I didn't really have the words to articulate to people like why it was working and I had friends and colleagues were like, you're enabling people, you're giving them syringes. You know, the classic resistance that we get when we're trying to um, employ harm reduction. Um, you know, and hopefully today, after 20 year, nearly 20 years, I have a few more words to articulate to you why it's a good idea. And that's what I hope to give you from my presentation, is to bring you examples from my work um, over that period of time with women who we've successfully used harm reduction to engage into services uh, in a really empowering way. Um, and um, this kind of touches on... Um, you know, some of the things we've already spoken about. And when I think about the work that I've done with, with women, I was thinking about, um, so I, I, when I was running the mobile syringe exchange, and I have a couple of colleagues in the audience, so big up to Frosted Syringe Exchange. There's a mobile program that goes out. It goes out to various sites in South Bronx, East Harlem, Bed-Stuy, Williamsburg, Coney Island. 
And I was particularly thinking about some of the women that I worked with in Coney Island who, um, for me, it's like this layers of shame that women experience, right? So it's like, I'm a woman who uses drugs of color, who's engaging in sex work for my survival, who has kids, who comes from a poor neighborhood with limited opportunities. Layer upon layer of stigma and shame that these women are experiencing. And, um, you know, and, and so when I talk, when I, you know, when I'm, my role now doing training and technical assistance for people who are wanting to um, actually establish harm reduction programs, but also folks who are working in other program areas like psychotherapy who want to integrate a harm reduction approach, we, we talk about these key elements of drug-related stigma. And we've, we've started to touch on these, but you know, the blame and moral judgment. So the women that we work with are not conforming to those wider social and cultural norms. Therefore, it's their own fault. You know, and I've heard practitioners say, that, well, of course she's got a mental health problem. She's been using drugs for years. You know, and sometimes it's like, well, maybe she had the mental health problem first, right? Maybe, and that's why she's using drugs and she's been self-medicating herself and meeting very important needs in terms of what she feels is helping her to cope with that mental health issue or has experienced violence and abuse and trauma that, you know, then she, again, kind of found that her drug use was a way of coping with that. But, um, you know, people kind of, you know, blame and, and cast this moral judgment. And then the next step is, is from that is to criminalise. And, and I'm sure Lynn will sp speak more about this. But what, what I've seen from my experience is that women within the criminal justice system are not treated the same as their male counterparts. I've swim, seen women, you know, up on a similar drug offence to, to a male, and they'll get a harsher sentence. Um, you know, so we know that there's a big inequality there for women um, in relation to being criminalised. And the, the pathologising, so the disease model that Andrew spoke about. And, you know, for some people, the disease model, they find that helps them. You know, oh, I'm not a... I'm not a bad person, I have a disease and maybe I can get treatment for it. For, but for many of the people and the women that I've worked with, is the disease model adds another layer of shame. It's a stigma to be labelled to have a disease and to be told that, well, you've got this disease of addiction, you're going to have it for the rest of your life and there's, you know, that's it. You know, and there's only one way to deal with that and that's abstinence. Um, you know, and that's not particularly helpful for some people. Um, and then the patronising aspect. So, you know... Um, relating that to, to the women I've worked with, it's like, well, you're weak and you can't really make decisions for yourself and you're not capable of looking after your children and so we need to do all that for you and we need to, you need to do what we're telling you to do to get better, um, which is not empowering, it's particularly patronising. And so overall what we see is this fear and isolation, which is kind of twofold in that society and, you know, wider social and cultural norms, um, you know, what, that people are not conforming to say, well, you're a bad influence or you're dangerous and we need to keep you over there, we need to keep you away from everybody else. But also for the person who uses drugs themselves, the fear and the shame, and they end up isolating themselves and not feeling like they can come forward for services and to get the help that they would need, and particularly for women that we work with. So when I was thinking about, you know, what we're talking about today, it's like, you know, we see this, the, the cultural and the social norms that are under, so, some of which are not particularly you know, based on science or evidence-based, you know, the whole um, development of the abstinence-based treatment models through through uh, the the spreading of, of uh, AA and abstinence-based uh, concepts, that they've become accepted as the social norm, and so they underpin our health services and our policies towards people who drugs, particularly women. Um, and for me, what I've seen is women being re-traumatized. You know, they've experienced trauma in the beginning. They then choose to use drugs which can have some traumatizing effects because, you know, as harm reductionists, we recognize it's not a bed of roses. It might re meet really important needs for you, but it's not a bed, and then maybe some traumas attached to that. And then our services and our policies add more trauma and re-traumatize people. So um, what I wanted to do um, for the re remainder is to kind of just focus on... Um, some of the ways in which the principle of harm reduction that we employ have really helped to engage women into services and offered an alternative. But just to kind of touch on, we've already spoken about this, right? Those of us working in harm reduction, 
Abstinence is only one of many goals. We're meeting people where they're at. And, you know, drug-related harm cannot always be assumed. When we're working with people, we need to really identify what important needs their drug use is meeting. So when we're working with them to develop with them the goals and strategies that they want to come up with, whatever their recovery pathway might be, whatever the changes in their drug use might be, we need to work with them around what those important needs are so that those are still being addressed. And abstinence-only models don't always take account of that. Um, and that we're really seeing drug users as more than just their drug use. You know, I've, ex I've had experiences with, with uh, people I've worked with who, you know, might not actually even be currently using. And as soon as it's disclosed that they've got a current or a previous history of drug use, everything that happens to them, everything that's suggested to them, every, uh, the way that people see them is just viewed through that lens of being a drug user. You know, and we've started to even change things like our language within harm reduction. We, we talk about people as being people who use drugs. We don't automatically use the word drug addict or drug abuser because that's an assumption before we've even started working with them, right? We want to work with people to identify whether they feel their drug use is problematic or not, or help them to define how problematic it is for them, not just make assumptions, uh, you know, of what we think is right for them. Um, so, so the key principles I've pulled out kind of elaborate a bit more on what Andrew has already mentioned in the beginning, um, that, we, you know, we're focusing on, you know, this concept of health and dignity. Um, for folks and you know we're thinking about both um, individuals health and not the overall wider community and when we think about women's roles in our community as the caregivers you know they they're looking after the children they're looking after parents you know they're supporting their families if we can create health you know if we can support women who drugs, use drugs to you know, to promote their health and dignity, that then has an impact on creating healthier families, healthier children, and overall healthier communities. And then, you know, in order to achieve that, we really want to create uh, participant-centered services that are uh, non-judgmental and non-coercive. Um, you know, and thinking about the examples from my practice is, you know, making um, services um, really low threshold and easy to access. Given that women that we work with may have multiple responsibilities and commitments that they need to take care of, as well as trying to then take care of themselves, and often that taking care of themselves comes last. Um, and that we have representative staff and peers and materials within our programs that really help women to feel comfortable about engaging, that we're creating safe spaces um, uh, where, you know, a lot of programs that um, in New York City that I've worked with, they might have women's groups, they have women's only times. Um, and one of the um, examples that I employ, um, employ both in the UK and the US is being mobile going out to women. What I saw in the programs that I worked with in, in both side, across both sides of the pond is that um, we, we saw more men actually coming into the storefront-based services. So when we were mobile, we were able to engage women in their own homes, out in their own communities, outreach into places where people, uh, where women are congregating and, f and may feel more comfortable uh, initially engaging with services. That we're thinking about things like childcare and safe waiting spaces for women to be able to feel that they, you know, their child can wait for them while they get services. That we're not limiting resources and we're thinking about specific resources, um, additional things that we provide like sanitary towels and tampons made a huge difference to the women that I was seeing out that were, you know, vulnerable street based, uh, you know, homeless uh, or unstably housed that, um, you know, we're not limiting how many syringes women can take. We I had um, women that used to come to our Coney Island site that were uh, a group of sex workers and they were operating, we think, from a building somewhere and they used to come in a car and they take thousands of syringes at a time. Um, because A, because they couldn't get there that often, and B, because there were other women that they worked with that couldn't get to us. So we encouraged them to take as much as they needed. And they were the, they were the best at bringing back their used syringes. They used to take big sharps containers and bring back every single one. They were very responsible when it came to their drug use. And we, you know, we validated that. Uh, and then just the last thing on this uh, example to give on this um, area is I spoke to a wonderful nurse called Sinstern that I'm sure some of you know in the room who works up at Washington Heights Co Corner Project. And we were speaking about, um, you know, even when we offer specific health services to women within our programs, um, you know, such as gynecological services, pap smears, breast exams, women, it takes a long time for women to build up that trust to even be able to undress or to be examined because very often they're coming to us having experienced lots of what Sin referred to as bad touch. 
they've been abused and traumatized. So like for me, when we added mobile medical services to our sites, I was like, great, some of these women that have been coming to, to the syringe exchange for all this time and we know never ever go to see the doctor because they're so ashamed to go. They don't want to disclose about the drug use. You know, God knows when the last time was they had a pap smear. Um, they're, gonna, they're gonna love it, they're gonna come on, they're gonna come straight away. And I saw that it took some of those women in Coney Island that I mentioned maybe three months to even, you know, get on the van and, to, you know, and then develop that relationship with the physician assistant, you know, to get to that point where they could receive services. And sometimes that leads back to the blame and moral judgment stuff that I was talking about earlier when I've heard petitioners say, well, we offered it and they didn't want to come. You know what I mean? Without any understanding of the courage that it takes for women to engage with those kind of services, let alone get undressed and have a physical exam. So... Um, and then, you know, participant involvement. So we're making sure that women are involved in the design and the implementation and the advocacy that we would do within harm reduction. One of the things I was thinking about in, in my time working in harm reduction, my gosh, there's been so many kick-ass women leaders in this field. We're very lucky that we have so many women leading programs, directing programs at the forefront of advocacy, you know, and, and maybe that's why we've done a good job of offering alternative, uh, you know, options for women um, to engage in services. Um, and then the participant autonomy piece as well. So, you know, recognizing that people who use drugs are experts in their own lives and they can make up, you know, they can decide their own recovery goals. Um, and some other examples for me, very tangible examples, were things like working with women that come to our programs who rely on their partners to inject them. Uh, very often, many of the women I met um, were initiated into, into injection drug use through a partner. And, you know, when you can't inject for yourself, then you have less control over how much drug you're using. It puts you more at risk of overdose and you may be more at risk of injection wounds. So by empowering a woman, a woman to be able to inject and take her own drugs, you give her more control over that, you know, overall in terms of the decisions she wants to make about her use moving forward. Um, and also it becomes really problematic if that partner is suddenly removed from the scene, either by arrest or leaves. You know, she's very vulnerable then uh, to poor injection techniques because she's not really been taught effectively how to do it for herself. Um, and then some of the other programs, policies, is um, things like when I was speaking to Washington Heights, you know, they have a policy where they don't send couples to detox together because sometimes the partner will leave before the woman is ready to leave and that means that that interrupts her own recovery pathway um, and things like that. So. And then social, cultural complexity, we've spoken about that, right? There's a lot, it's all this complicated um, mix of social inequalities that women especially experience. And that I talked about that in terms of the layers of shame. Um, and I think one of the things that we try and do as well within our programs is to really empower women to get an understanding of what's going on and why they feel the way they do, why they feel so, their, their self-esteem is so low, what, what it is they've experienced and how people respond to them. And to be able to reframe that for themselves and to then be able to challenge stigma um, and, you know, helping to promote positive images. And I, I had hoped that one, um, a colleague of mine, Marilyn, who um, works at Vocal, who is an amazing activist, and some people are nodding at me in the room because they know her, and that's with a short piece of video that, unfortunately, her daughter got sick, so as a carer for her daughter, she had to leave today to go to school to pick up a daughter, but she was going to come and speak and speak about her experience of how harm reduction programming has supported her. But for her, you know, that ability now to be in a position where she goes to Albany and she talks to the lawmakers and she challenges those stigma at that level, at a policy and lawmaking level, is an amazing thing and an amazing journey um, that many of the women that I've had the honor to work with have, have uh, come through. Um, and then just a final thing about the, you know, the pragmatism and realism of harm reduction. So, you know, we're not condemning or condoning. We are recognizing that there are significant harms to using drugs. But I also think that this, the pragmatism and the realism plays out in how we then respond to people's drug use, drug use by offering realistic alternatives to the abstinence only um, you know, options and recognizing one size doesn't fit so all. We, we've heard that a lot this evening already. Um, you know, and we're especially helpful in engaging women to find those realistic options and responses for themselves, um, you know, so that they are overcoming barriers and we're not adding to the shame and the trauma that they've already experienced and we can really tailor things to a woman's need. Um, so, 
you know, and just one thing, thing to mention, it's about the spirit of delivery, right? It's not always what we're delivering, it's how we're delivering it. I've seen examples of syringe exchange being done in a very clinical manner where someone in a white coat hands you a syringe and it's like, well, how much shame would you like with that? You know, it's not, it's done in a very judgmental way. You know, and I've done work with pharmacists around this where we have like, in the UK, we did, I did work training up pharmacists to understand it, you know, cause, cause then they weren't like, you know, giving people syringes, like not, being, you know, they were just so judgmental in the way that they were doing it. Um, and we've, you know, we've done, some work in, in uh, New York around that, it's called ESAP, the Extended, Expended Syringe Access Provision through Pharmacists. Uh, but I think, you know, maybe the spirit of what we do is why we've been able to successfully engage women into our programs. And I know this is a really common quote, but for some reason, when I was preparing for today, I've seen this around so many times that, you know, so what I think is the small group of crazy harm reduction warriors that started out in the early 90s, you know, we're actually, because now there's more and more evidence to back up that this is a really successful approach for many people, that our, our small group is getting larger. And at the moment, there's lots of help. And, and Andrew referred to this, you know, it's a really exciting time to be engaged in harm reduction. There's so many things coming on the scene in relation to it. Um, you know, at our conference in Baltimore that, um, last year, we had the drug czar, you know, working with Obama, come and give our opening speech, which was a huge, huge thing to happen, um, you know. Um, so there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of development and change and hope coming online. And just to give you a sense of some of the stuff that's going on in New York right now is, you know, this greater acceptance of an alternative approach. So, like, hopefully no more drug war. That's the slogan that DPA use. I actually have a T-shirt with that on, which I like to wear. Um, and what we're working for in New York State is a full decriminalization of syringes so that... Um, you know, at, mo at, the, at the moment, people have to prove that they got their syringes from a syringe exchange or a pharmacy. Uh, but we just want it to be totally decriminalised because it, it just it just muddies the waters too much. And we're also working to expand the ESAP, which is the uh, syringe access through pharmacies. And then institutionalising overdose programmes. We're currently, I'm piloting a programme in Department of Corrections where we're training up folks who are about to come out of prison so that they can choose to have the naloxone or Narcan kits with them when they leave prisons. We're also working with CUNY and SUNY around this as well for students to be aware of overdose prevention. And then we, you know, New York, uh, NYPD are all trained to carry naloxone kits now. And we're hearing some amazing stories where police officers are saving lives and the whole view is just being transformed um, around kind of harm reduction. And then, you know, hep we're campaigning for more hep C funding, and now we have a cure. For many years, we couldn't tell people there was a cure. We could just say that it kind of put it into remission, and now we actually have medications. Even though it's available, there's still barriers to access because it's very expensive, but we're working on it. And just to say that in terms of regional and global policy, um, next year, um, the UN have their special assembly um, in relation to drug use and HRC is coordinating community-based groups to be the community liaison with the UN to it hopefully inform some big changes, not just, you know, we've got a lot of national stuff going on, but, um, you know, we've got some global and regional stuff. So it's an exciting time to be involved, um, you know. So thank you. <laughs> I'm just going to, if it's all right, the, the quick video of Marilyn, we would, yeah, we're just going to show it. Um, so, no, I'm going to let it speak for itself. Okay. Because they came where I came from to where I'm at today. 
I love my kids. I'm back to my kids. nice segue for you actually right into parenting. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, since this is a, a harm reduction uh, event, I just should start with my first impressions when I, I went to my first harm reduction conference. And what I came away with, th those are of, uh, the Harm Reduction Coalition, um, where they really integrate academics with uh, people who are directly affected. There is a kind of uh, a common, I think, science fiction trope. You know, the aliens are going to come to Earth, and we're so puny and so thoughtless and so cruel to one another that we're really not worth saving. So why not just kill us and save us for meat back on the home planet? I don't know if this is sounding familiar, but the aliens come. And usually it ends when, uh, in the good movies, it ends when somebody, usually a child, does an act of such kindness and humanity that the, the aliens go, I guess we can't really kill them all. And that's how the movie, and I felt like all those people were at the harm reduction conference. They were the people <laughs> who were doing the, the most, showing such extraordinary humanity that the aliens could, wouldn't be able to decide to take us all back to uh, fr frozen and, and for service. So anyway, I founded the Nas a National Advocates for Pregnant Women. Uh, I'm an attorney, and I, s I started out defending the right to choose abortion. And I started getting cases involving uh, the uh, ways in which anti-abortion arguments are used to hurt women who have no intention of ending their pregnancies. Some of those cases are cases where women are forced to have unwanted cesarean surgery. Uh, based on the claim that if you don't do what the doctor tells you immediately, it's no different than having an abortion. We can take custody of your body and cut you open. But many of the cases were women who gave birth to newborns, most of them perfectly healthy, who tested positive for a criminalized drug. And they were arrested on some prosecutor's theory that uh, uh, child abuse could apply to uh, a fetus. And a woman having taken a criminalized drug uh, could be arrested. So in addition to uh, enormous, uh, we hear about biological differences, we heard about you know, sort of uh, responsibility differences, women remain targeted in ways that are extraordinary. And that's because in, the, in this country, it's really the meeting of the war on drugs with an effort to recriminalize abortion and really take back the gains, all the gains, that uh, women have achieved in the last um, 100 years. Um, we really try to ensure that laws and policies are fair for everyone, including pregnant women, including drug-using pregnant women. And, and one of the things that I notice, even among drug policy reformers, I've heard them say, well, you know, we're, we're for decriminalization, we're for, uh, you know, harm reduction, but really we can't talk about pregnant women because they're the third rail. They're the folks who are going, going to derail our efforts to uh, make this, uh, to address this as a public health problem. And my response always to that is, they may be the third rail, but I'm from Manhattan and I know the trains don't run without the third rail. <laughs> so um, here are some of the things about pregnant women and drug use. Um, I, I'm sad to say that the uh, previous drug czar, who was moving us closer to, uh, it was a period of time where no agency in the, uh, in the U.S. government would allow you to say the word harm next to the word reduction. It was really just like you cannot do it, and, and especially the Harm Reduction Coalition uh, and, and the work um, that, that Andrew's done has pushed and gotten them to at least say those words together and appear at some conferences. But f fascinating to me is that the last uh, uh, previous drug czar, Gil Kurlikowski, who was really moving the administration away from a purely punitive approach, uh, the Global Commission on Drug Policy came out with a statement against criminalization. And his answer was an article uh, under his name in Roll Call, as I, uh, as I have it right, saying, you know, science has to provide the answer. And his argument was um, drugs should remain criminalized because there are real victims. And who are those real victims? The babies born to women who use drugs while they were pregnant. So he was using this, this, this terrible 
uh, stigmatizing, uh, alarmist, and medically and scientifically inaccurate alarm of focusing on pregnant women in drug use, not just to justify particularized punishment of pregnant women. He would have said he wasn't doing that, but overall saying that's why we have to allow, keep arresting people. And part of that is a willingness to believe so much stigma versus science. Um, I had the privilege in, uh, a long time ago to look at news reporting on, on drugs through U.S. history. And it turns out, if you watch, every time there's a new permutation of an old drug, so opium to morphine to heroin, the news reports say the most addictive, the most destructive ever. And it always turns out that no, it really isn't instantly addictive, it isn't more addictive than other drugs, and that there was an alarm. But for some reason, uh, investigative journalists in particular, uh, many of whom I'm related to, um, really, uh, for some reason, stop thinking when those things come out. So we have the myth of the crack baby. How many of you have heard of that? Well, it turns out that as a matter of science, there is no such thing in the sense of if you eat a lot of broccoli during pregnancy, you don't have broccoli babies. Um, and it turns out that the risks of harm from exposure to prenatal drugs, to prenatal exposure to drugs, is less than uh, the risks of harm uh, from exposure for cigarettes. And many more people smoke cigarettes. My mother smokes cigarettes. I'm not called a nicotine baby or a nick baby or a cig baby. Um, I do like to say that maybe if my mother hadn't smoked, I might be a for-profit lawyer. I don't know. <laughs> um, but. One of the big questions is, why were journalists and the public willing to believe that such a thing existed as crack babies? And, and that was, here's a group of women, almost always portrayed as African American women, willing to take a drug that they knew would cause permanent, uh, irremediable harm of their babies. You know, sort of comparing it to like the very rare drugs like um, thalidomide, which was a, a drug that women took that caused their babies to be born with severe limb defects. Well, why would we believe that any group of women would do that? I know that if I do this, this will harm my baby. Well, first of all, uh, as epidemiologists point out, the real cocaine epidemic in this country was in the 1970s when people were, rich people were using cocaine. And so where are all the cocaine babies that, from that? They didn't exist because it was about race and class. And why were people willing to believe that African American women would do something so damaging to their own babies? Because it's the legacy of slavery. We had to convince, we being white people, people who owned slaves had to convince themselves that black women didn't care about their babies so they could be sold away into slavery. And then we have to convince uh, uh, ourselves that black women don't care about their children so we can make them clean our houses and not take care of their own children. This is the same, so the possibility of believing the junk science that was presented over and over and over again um, is, has everything to do with not just the drug war but also race and class. Uh, if you read uh, early news reports, uh, typically never quoted a research scientist. Uh, they re would quote a sheriff about its effect or a local prosecutor. But if you read down far enough in some articles, an actual scientist would say, actually, we really don't know that much about this. And for now, uh, these it's not a good idea to take cocaine while you're pregnant, but we're not seeing a category of harms that get, deserves a label. The current uh, hysteria is about opioids, uh, women on painkillers, women uh, who give birth to babies who have what's called neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, let, me, let me just also make a, an observation about uh, academics and the work. If you read any article about drug use and pregnant women and parenting, the way that uh, uh, peer-reviewed journals work is you have a background beginning and you sort of summarize everybody else's work. And it is, it is not, peer review may be what your friends say, your peers say, but it isn't necessarily researched. And typically what they'll do is they'll try to paint a crisis. Substance abuse by pregnant women is a serious issue. Fund us. Give me more research money. And then if you read it carefully, what they will cite is data about drug use. 
Drug use is not the same as drug dependence, is not the same as addiction. These are very different things. The vast majority of people who use drugs, including pregnant women, are neither dependent nor addicted. And even knowing that can't tell you very much about their lives, whether they work, whether they care for their children. So we have a kind of academic, uh, pseudo-academic, um, um, body of work out there that keeps reinforcing a lot of myths. Uh, we tend to focus on drug use in pregnant women, as, and part of that is not just about the war on drugs, but a mythology that the greatest threat to our children are, are their own mothers. Uh, if you look at risks uh, numerically to the health and well-being of children, you've got obesity, you've got hypertension, you've got poverty, you've got cigarettes, you've got alcohol. The smallest percentage of women are using any controlled substance, criminalized drug. Four to five percent of all pregnant women use a criminalized drug. Most of them are using marijuana. Um, and, and again, none of the drugs, none of the criminalized drugs uh, cause permanent damage. Uh, they may make your pregnancy somewhat less healthy. We don't recommend that you use it, but they're not good at causing stillbirths. They're not good uh, at causing uh, significant harms. And to the extent researchers are finding harms, and they make a living doing that because we have the National Institute of Drug Abuse, not the National Institute on Drugs that f fairly funds research. If they find any, any increase in risk, even if that is minimal, even if it has no comparison to the uh, increase of risk by being impoverished or not eating well, that will get published and reported as this drug causes this, uh, you know, causes this harm. Uh, in terms of the latest scare in, uh, for neonatal abstinence syndrome, it's a terrible name because it sounds like fetal alcohol syndrome, which has been thought of as, as if a woman drinks enough alcohol, usually huge quantities, and is also probably malnourished and probably has a genetics predisposition. There can be a syndrome called fetal alcohol syndrome that had been believed to be not fixable, but I think there's some change on that as well. Neonatal abstinence syndrome is not like that. It's, we should should call it neonatal treatable syndrome. For women who use opioids, which means opiates, treatment for opiates, methadone and suboxone, painkillers, certain kinds of painkillers, the newborn may experience what's a set of symptoms labeled neonatal abstinence syndrome, a withdrawal sequence, which is absolutely treatable. And the need to provide any medication for that period after birth is reduced if mothers are respected uh, and, and uh, if mothers are respected. So research has shown that if mothers are allowed to keep their newborns with them, those mothers who'd been using opioids or maintenance treatments, and have skin-to-skin -skin contact, and if they're allowed to breastfeed, as opposed to having these babies whisked away, reported to child welfare, and put in neonatal intensive care units, their symptoms of neonatal abstinence are reduced. So basic harm reduction, human compassion methods uh, work, but very few hospitals use them. And then you get a study that says these babies cost so much money. It's not because they cost so much money. It's because hospitals essentially are malpracticing by do, putting into place punitive policies. So I want to talk about two, two kinds of policies that we challenge. Uh, there has been an ongoing effort to redefine pregnant women in general, and put, starting with drug using pregnant women as child abusers. And again, it serves a great purpose, because if women are the greatest risk to their own children, then we don't have to look at how our government fails us in terms of housing, in terms of access to health care, in terms of privatizing public schools and public resources in general. Uh, the way it has happened in the past is a prosecutor will bring a charge against Cornelia Whitner, an African-American woman in South Carolina who gives birth to a healthy baby. Uh, that baby tests positive for cocaine, and she's charged with uh, endangerment of a child. Uh, a criminal law that doesn't mention drugs, that's about endangering children once they're born. But they make the argument that a child in South Carolina includes fetuses, so it's advancing an anti-abortion agenda. Uh, and, and because it's cocaine, and we all know how terrible that drug is, we should uh, judicially expand the law. And despite, having, despite the fact that every medical group says, don't do this, this is bad for babies, forget feminism, forget respecting women, threatening women with arrest will discourage them from coming for prenatal care, don't do it. 
the Supreme Court of, Al of South Carolina said, no, you know, this is really, we're not gonna have to deal with all those other issues. We're gonna redefine um, child endangerment to include what a woman does during her pregnancy. It started with a woman who used cocaine. It's been used uh, for women who smoke marijuana. It's been used for pregnant women who used alcohol. It's been used for a pregnant woman who at 18 and eight months of pregnancy jumped out of a window. Um, she was severely depressed, had had mental health problems. She survived, lost the baby, and was arrested for homicide by child abuse. Uh, and to challenge it would have meant staying in jail for probably decades, so she ended up pleading to something else. Uh, four states now, actually uh, three states through their criminal laws, one through a weird child abuse law, allow the uh, incarceration of women who, go, who get pregnant, don't have abortions, give birth and have babies who have perfectly healthy babies and test positive for a criminalized drug. Um, we have using the war on drugs to advance an agenda uh, that is designed to set precedent that can be used against all pregnant women. Uh, we have to ask ourselves, who profits? Who profits by incarceration? We now have a, not, a private in, uh, prison industrial complex. Who profits from all the drug testing that's required uh, through the criminal justice system and drug courts? And what happens to women too, and, and this is a place to come back to harm reduction, is that they are subject to civil child welfare interventions and penalties in a way that fathers aren't. Um, in most state, in more than 20 states, civil child welfare cases, not an arrest, but the threat of losing your child, uh, can be based on nothing more than a positive drug test. And as you saw in the video, I often come with my cup of urine. I took it to my the, uh, the an ON, uh, Office of National Drug Control Policy meeting, and I said, here, and I give, I pass it around, and and I I say, look, I don't, you know, test it. It might be, you know, it might be positive for marijuana, it might be positive for heroin, but there is nothing in that cup that can tell you whether I'm drug dependent, whether I'm a, an addict, or whether I love my children, care for them, or anything else. And yet, child welfare policies in most states, even in New York, where the law does not actually authorize this, if you are low income, and particularly if you are a woman of color, your right to parent, your ability to stay connected to your children can be determined by a cup of pee. And so we have distorted family values, we've distorted health care, not only in, in, through criminalization, but also through a punitive child welfare system that is based on myths and misinformation. New Jersey just, uh, New Jersey argued that women being in methadone treatment while they're pregnant, which is the recommended treatment, not only by the federal government, but by New Jersey, is child abuse if the child is born with the treatable and expected symptoms of neonatal abstinence syndrome. So we need to uh, make sure uh, we will never achieve an end to the war on drugs or a healthcare system that truly allows harm reduction if it doesn't include everyone. So for women in the child welfare system, basically harm reduction is not an option. Because if you're not abstinent, you can't get your kid back. So the recognition that drug use is drug use. People, most people who drink alcohol don't become alcoholics. Most people who use uh, drugs don't become, develop dependencies or addictions that sometimes then interfere with their ability to work and care for their children. We will never succeed if we don't include everyone. And that has to include pregnant and parenting women uh, who, like everybody else, use drugs, drink alcohol, sometimes develop problems, and when they develop those problems, they should not be afraid that by seeking help they will lose their children or in many more states get, ar and many states get arrested. Thank you. I feel very lucky and honored to be a part of this panel to help organize this. And you know, I'm really grateful to our speakers for just you know, highlighting this important cause and you know that I hope that you will take this information with you and spread the word. And you know what we're doing is shifting the paradigm. We're talking about you know an approach that's affirming, that's respectful, that's compassionate, and that's much more attuned and aware of the context and the policies that are in place that are really creating stigma and more harm. So we're really here to, to promote health, you know, a holistic, empowering model for for working with women. So with that, I want to open it up to 
the group here and have time for questions, discussions, comments. So anybody want to ask a question or just you know comment on what we've talked about so far? I asked this question earlier. Um, I understand the term harm reduction in terms of the work that Ms. Roberts is doing, but isn't it an awful terminology for other things like drinking moderately? Where is the harm reduction? Um, or doing recreational drugs responsibly? I think of harm as something that is harmful. Um, and it's just an off-putting terminology. So I'm wondering from a marketing point of view, I mean, Alcoholics Anonymous sounds more inviting than harm reduction at this point. So I'm, I'm just wondering about broad reactions to that. That's a good point. <laughs> um, and I hadn't kind of, I hadn't really thought about that in depth. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Do you want to? No, I, I think that criticism is a very valid, a valid one. I've heard it before. I'm, you know, I didn't invent harm reduction. Um, I'm not wedded to it. I think maybe just calling it a public health approach or a health approach or a human rights approach, all of those will work. Somebody came up with it. There is a fair, a growing movement of people who use it. I often think of, you know, we could call that you know, sex education harm reduction too. Since since sexuality is so often described as harm, misdescribed as harmful. So I, th I think it's a good criticism. You know, uh, the only thing I can say in general, especially coming out of work defending the right to choose abortion, is my son showed me a bumper sticker once. It said, "New bumper sticker resolves abortion debate." You know. <laughs> There's only, it's, it's messaging only gets you so far, in, no matter how good we are at it. So, yeah. I've heard that a lot of people in, in this country are allergic, even people who, who use and practice and recommend harm reduction tech, techniques to their patients are resistant to it. They don't call it that because of exactly what you say. And there's so much resistance at the, at the highest level. Because at the highest level, as Andrew was saying earlier, at the highest level, at NIDA, at the NIAAA, the National Institutes for Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, which, by the way, are so outdated, those words, alcoholism has not been in the DSM since 1980. OK, let's change the language, people. But um, one of the. W w w w I'm, I met with some of the top guys at the NIAAA last summer, and they said in a meeting, after having said, oh, we want to support moderation, and we want to support moderate m methods of drinking, and even looking into harm reduction, when I got there to see them in Bethesda, the first thing they said was abstinence is the best goal, period. Yeah, so, so historically, I mean, they, there were, it was a bunch of guys sitting around in Europe in the late 80s who were actually talking. I mean, Ernie Drucker, um, uh, Pat O'Hare, I think Jerry Stimson, some people were sitting around tr sort of, you know, what should we call it? Harm minimization, harm reduction, and for whatever reason, they, cho they chose that term. I think, unfortunately, it's not the greatest term, but it is one that sort of distinguishes these approaches that we're talking about, this philosophy from that one that you just heard Gabrielle, um, you know, share from NIAAA. So it, it, it has a kind of um, challenging political function, I think, and distinguishes between these two different approaches. If we could come up with a better name, that would be great. There's a question way back there, please. Oh, I think her hand was up first. Yeah, could I quickly address, address the term harm reduction um, as someone that works in harm reduction? In addition to the term harm reduction, a lot of us are talking about benefit maximization mm -hmm. because we realize that all drugs, heroin, crack, alcohol, nicotine, they all have benefits. And you should maximize the benefits and reduce the harms, and they go hand in hand. And it's recognizing drugs are good. 
and they're bad too. <laughs> um, this question is for Gabrielle mostly. Um, at the beginning when you were, there's been so much said that hopefully I don't totally mangle this, but um, you were saying th certain things that um, might be connected to women's, to an increase in drinking among women as a population. Mm -hmm. One of those was eating disorders. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if um, anyone had theorized as to what the connection is, as, or is there just that if you're at risk for one, you're, you are possibly at risk for another? You know, there has not been a ton of research on it, but you are at risk for one mm -hmm. if you have experienced it, even resolved that eating disorder. It, there's something about the brain chemistry, the endorphin release, the, the, the experience of, and I've also read that bulimics tend to have more of an instance of alcohol misuse than anorexics. Mm -hmm. Anorectics. But good question. This is a question directed for, for Lynn particularly, but anybody. Um, thank you for your presentation. I work in New Jersey with pregnant parenting women in a residential treatment facility. They're mandated. They're also indigent, low income, um, suffer from a lot of stigma. Um, recently had a woman who did well in my treatment program. Um, her case went to court because of the one year minimum or maximum time being separate and she lost her child. Um, and so my question to you is, I'm a practitioner, I don't, how, how do we advocate? I mean, I talk about it, I tell the story. Um, harm reduction is a bad word in the world of mandated treatment. How and where do we advocate? Uh, that's a, you know, we're trying to figure out all the ways we can do that. And some of the ways we do it is through the courts, which I, you know, I, I didn't even bother to say that we won in the New Jersey Supreme Court. They said, you know, methadone treatment isn't, by pregnant women is not per se child abuse, civil child abuse. But I feel like we lost because they remanded it back down to say, but maybe you can still look at whether she got into methadone treatment in a timely fashion when she was pregnant. The idea that child abuse laws allow people to judge prenatal care. So we have a lot, we have to think about a lot of things. What it sounds like happened to your client is that she was, parental rights were terminated as a result of the American Safe Family Act. So you should be writing to every legislator you know, telling them that story, asking to meet with them, asking to have her go meet with them and saying this should be repealed. This law is, is, has been recognized particularly to be counterproductive around recovery, I mean drug, drug recovery and so forth. But you know, it's also like what, in terms, that's a federal statute. It's also doing everything you can to challenge the child welfare laws in New Jersey and meeting with everybody about, everybody you can. Uh, that person's sit council person, that person's assembly person, um, going and saying that the child welfare laws are not a mechanism for super, should not be used as a mechanism for supervising drug use by pregnant women and parents. And this is what it leads to. It leads to destroying families, not saving them. So I, you know, I, I'm nervous. <laughs> I'm not a lobbyist. So when I have to call an elected official, I get a little nervous too. But I can't tell you, especially with your authority, how, what a difference it can make. Um, sign up with us because there are hearings and testimony that might be needed in New Jersey. And do call us and call the um, New Jersey, uh, I can't remember the full name, uh, par parental representation. If you see a client who's not being well represented in a family court action, we are a small organization, even though we have national in our names. But a lot, the, so, there is often extremely passive representation on behalf of parents in the child welfare system. To the extent we've gotten involved in cases in New Jersey, it's sometimes because the social worker calls us up and says, the lawyer's telling her to say, yes, I am a child abuser because I'm in methadone treatment. And we've been able to at least help in those cases. Thank you. 
but uh, you know what? Uh, let me just say this. We do a lot of charity, right? And we do a lot of treatment. To what extent will any of our programs incorporate a part that says to your clients, we're going to teach you how to advocate. We're going to teach you how to go to Trenton. We're going to teach you how to testify. We're going to get you to meet with vocal, right? To, to, and, and in the same way that abortion clinics don't offer people uh, avenues uh, to activism, why don't drug treatment programs? And you should mm -hmm. talk about vocal. Yeah, so in New York, we have vocal that uses union um, that represent, you know, the rights of people who use drugs. And, you know, they regularly are up in Albany in New York, um, you know, campaigning and um, speaking to uh, the officials there. I was there um, last week. We were doing Hep C Legislative Awareness Day. And, this, and the, the, the steps for forward we've made by doing that and having people who use drugs at the forefront of that uh, has been amazing and they can I mean I don't know what kind of advocacy groups there are in New Jersey but they would be a great organization to look to to learn from about what can be done um, and we've even got vocal peers now going to Baltimore um, helping them to establish Sharin's access programs and overdose prevention programs over there by teaching <coughs> peers over in other uh, states and other cities how you know what how to do what they've done so you know also there's a recently organized program in New Jersey called families for sensible drug policy oh, um, yeah, yeah. Carol Katz Bayer and Barry Lesson, psychologist from Philadelphia, have organized this. Right now it's a Facebook group, mm -hmm. uh, but th I think it's got about 300 members. They are extremely uh, active and committed to um, developing a large coalition of people that can advocate for families with drug users, um, and I think they may be a very good resource mm -hmm. to connect with. Mm -hmm. uh, families for Sensible Drug Policy. If you go on Facebook, it'll take you to them. Uh, to our sister from the UK, I forgot your name. Emma. Emma. Mm -hmm. uh, what I liked about your story was, uh, is it a truck or a bus that comes to the neighborhoods? Um, so the program that I worked on, run that program <laughs> um, yeah so you know and there's there's different programs through um, in New York and throughout the US that employ that and I certainly use that in the UK um, to kind of complement the building based services that we do and it certainly allows you access to people who wouldn't perhaps normally come in for services uh, for a whole host of reasons uh, I was wondering <coughs> if there was signage on it so that maybe they might be ashamed, like to enter the truck. Um, the the race, so people can identify us, but I think people are careful um, about what that signage might be and how big it is. Um, so yeah, and but sometimes there isn't. Um, you know, in the UK, my van was a had nothing on it. You know, and we but we we were able to um, do a lot of word of mouth, so people knew where to find us. Uh, and what we look like. So, yeah, it's something to consider. Yeah. Um, I'll never forget the our sister program in the UK called Genesis, which was a sex workers program, were funded by the local authority who decided that the best slogan for their van was riding your way to health, which the women found particularly hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, I'm Dorothy Henderson, and I'm the Director of Early Childhood Trauma Services at JBFCS. And one of the programs that I run is called the Court Team for Babies. It's a court team that works with the judges of Manhattan Family Court. And I work very closely with Susan Chinitz from Einstein in the Bronx Family Court. And another group that sometimes can be very approachable and um, very smart people are the judges themselves. And I think that we have judges in Manhattan Family Court who lis listen to our reports. And if, if a mother is coming up to a TPR point, termination of parental rights, and we say we've been doing all this relationship-based work and you just can't look at that cup of tea, um, that they actually will suspend judgment and allow a mother more time. And if you don't mind, I'm going to steal your cup of tea um, I'll take it with me to <laughs> Chicago next week. Um, 
But I also just want to say that I think we do have to challenge the laws in New York and New Jersey that says that if you have a mom, and maybe some of you don't know this, but in New York, in New York City, the policy for administration for children's services is that if you currently have children in foster care, even if you have been through a re uh, either a residential or an ongoing program, um, substance abuse program, even if you haven't had any um, positive tox for anything in that little teacup, and if you, if you become pregnant during the time that your children are on foster care, your children can be automatically removed. Newborns can be automatically removed from the hospital and placed in care as well. And that's a fight that I've decided to take on big time in New York because we're working with mothers who are working their programs and doing very well and still having their children removed. And how hopeless can that be? Well, thank you for your comments. Um, I'm wondering if we have any more questions or if we want to wrap up. And thank you so much for coming tonight. I look forward to hosting more panels like this in the future. We'll keep you posted. Thank you. Thank you.